Okay, well, uh, we want everyone to really feel like they're getting the, a premium look into what Judaism is all about, no matter if they're sitting at home or they get to be here. Of course, I want everyone here, but while we're waiting for our, our great next journey as our community to unfold and manifest, it's what? Go ahead, fix the tilt. To a glass, you please. So we were saying, we were talking about um, the topic of success and that the Jewish version of success is when your innermost will, in other words, your innermost foundation of who you want to be and your outer will, the things you do in your life, align. How are we doing? You're switching it to there? Yeah, I have to start and stop if you want to redo it. I mean, I mean, we're here. We're having it happen. There you go. It's not even, it's, uh, we have the top engineers in San Francisco working on the problem, trust me, right? We have Facebook and Amazon engineers working, they're on the case. So we got it covered. All right? So this week, whereas last week we thought about the, the, what, what are the things that we would like to be successful in, this week I'd like to think about what are the chances of being, of being successful do you really believe you could be successful? And this is not a little question. This is worth calming down for a moment, taking a deep breath and thinking about, do I really believe I'm going to be successful in my life? And we're not being abstract when we say life. Remember, we picked out three things that we really would like to be successful in. So let's say you chose that I really want to have an amazing relationship with a significant other. Let's say that's, that's, I, when all things come down, I want to live my life knowing that I had an amazing relationship with somebody. Now the question is, do you really believe that's going to happen? Soon we're going to have to talk about what steps you need to make to make that happen. But if you're not living in a bubble and you look out in the world and the world likes to talk about uh, uh, relationships uh, uh, in their evolving state and marriages have a, a low success rate and, uh, enough to elect something. And, and because of those challenges, if you really believe that you would like to have this long-term relationship, how do you make your outside align with your inside? In other words, how do you connect the dots that your life is gonna be this way? And if that's the case, do you believe you're gonna be able to do that? And that's not even the hard stuff because that's the stuff like, of course, I love this person, I'm in the relationship, I'm gonna make this happen. But what about when it comes to an even deeper desire, the reason why I have a heartfelt relationship? You don't have a great relationship just to have a great relationship. You have a great relationship in order to fulfill your life. You believe that with this person I'm gonna share the rest of my life with, I am also going to be the best person I can be. I'm gonna reach my potential. So do you believe you're going to reach your potential? In other words, do you believe you're going to be a successful being? Can you get the outside world or the outer will and desires that I deal with aligned with my innermost will and desire? Can I achieve that? And according to Judaism, once again, we like to do spoiler alerts because we're not so much into horror and suspense here on the Jewish Learning uh, Network. We simply say, yes, you can have that mindset and we're going to talk about why and how. The first thing somebody needs to know in order to achieve something is the belief that they're going to be successful. The first time I ran a half marathon, you wouldn't look at it by the size of me now, but you know, I had my moments and, and uh, I was having a tough time breaking the barrier of getting into a rhythm with running. And I uh, thought about, wow, from my childhood, I knew an individual who uh, became a sports psychologist and he wrote a little book and I got his book. It's called Grateful Running. And uh, it was an homage to his love for the Grateful Dead, which I thought was very Bay Area-esque. So perfect, right? And I got the book, and there were a lot of mantras that were very helpful for running. Like, whenever I was breaking a point with my breath, they had these uh, meditations of with every breath I get stronger, being able to integrate that into an actual meditation while I'm running was very powerful for me. So the belief in sports, this is obvious, Sports psychology isn't a joke. You want people to be successful in their sports. They have to learn to visualize their success. In other words, break down what's going to happen and see how you're going to get there. So belief in, being in, in, in what you're doing is very important. But when you talk about the abstract nature of 
my innermost desires connected to being a great person or having great family values or being uh, 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 the Jew I, I hope to be or being a good person, making the world a better place, leaving it better than I came. These are very abstract ideas. They're huge ideas that people easily say, of course, I just want to be a good person and I want to make this world a better place, but how are you, how are you doing that? Is it just a general concept? How do we get there? And the first thing is we need to believe that we can get there. There's a psychologist here at Stanford, uh, right south of us, Albert Bandura, and he plays around with this concept, this uh, psychological concept of believing in self-sufficiency, believing that what I have is enough to be successful. One of the theories is that what gets in the way of people really believing that they could be successful is they don't believe they have right now what it takes to be successful. And as I've learned from Burning Man, radical self-sufficiency is the name of the game. A human being needs to integrate in their life this idea that they are self-sufficient. What I have and what I use and my talents, they are sufficient to fulfill my mission on earth. You have to believe in yourself. Believing in yourself means that what I have and who I am is great and great enough to fulfill my mission on earth. That is the modern psychological self-sufficient idea of being able to believe that what you're doing and what you have to do is enough to get that big mission done. Uh, I don't like to quote uh, noted anti-Semitic figures like Henry Ford, but his line, whether you believe you can do a thing or not, you are right. That's his line. The Jewish line is a little deeper. His line is, if you believe you can do it or believe you can't do it, you're right, right? Because what you believe in, that's what you're gonna be able to do. And that's the, now the psychological elements that are being really developed and, and, uh, and uh, Albert Brandura, the professor, is, is quite the professor to say the least. He's one of the top in his field. And he's integrating that as almost like a, a factual way of beginning the process. You wanna really begin the process of being a successful person, you have to start believing to be successful. But according to our discussion, we spoke about inner will and outer will, there's a deeper line. And the deeper line is the way the Baal Shem Tov, the first Hasidic master used to say, he used to say that where your will is, that's where you are. In other words, where you invest yourself, that's where you are. You want you, you call yourself, you don't know me. You know parts of me, but you don't know me. So who's the real you? Well, in reality, the real you is what you're invested in. People like to say, I am this person. Well, when I do that, I know it's not a becoming of me, but that's not the real me. You know who the real me is. Comes Hasidic philosophy and spirituality and says, no, where you invest yourself, that's where you are. What is that idea, where you invest yourself, that's where you are? It's a way of life. In other words, believing that you're gonna be successful is not a good approach to being successful. It's a way of life. You have to always believe that I have radical self-sufficiency. I can handle what comes my way. No matter what personality type you are, no matter what your therapist says, and no matter what your friends say, no matter who you think you are, you have the ability to be successful in everything you choose to be successful at. That is the undertone of success, is making it a way of life to believe that you're going to be successful. And here is the Jewish, the original, Jewish success story in, in a truly impactful way is the first person with the name Israel. Jacob, our forefather, he gets the name Israel. Jacob has a very difficult life. His life starts off with being a, a quiet yeshiva boy. He's a person of the tent, sits and studies. But then in the first sign of chaos, his brother wants to kill him. He has to manipulate him. He ends up running for his life. He ends up going to, hey, then he ends up going to his uncle and his uncle manipulates him in the kinds of relationships he's gonna have and marriage and difficulties, etc. And then after he deals with his uncle, then he deals with his brother again who tries to kill him. Then after he deals with his brother again, then he has this whole encounter with an angel. He's constantly finding it difficult to make the next step. He's always hitting life or death pinnacle moments in his existence. To me, stories in the Torah are not history stories. They're extreme examples of self-sufficiency, of God giving you the ability to handle whatever comes your way. 
you, if you believe in God and you're born with meaning, that means whatever you're going to need to be successful, you have. And our prime example of that is Jacob, because Jacob is an individual who taps into self-sufficiency, being able to deal with whatever comes his way. And by the way, he has no preparation for the business world. He was a guy sitting in school. He hit the business world just like we do, coming uh, come blind, trying to figure it out. And what's the problem in the business world? The problem in the business world is competitiveness on the one hand is good. When there's competition, it obviously breeds industry. But competitiveness also brings out the worst parts of people, where people start undermining other people's success because they think that gets in the way of their own success. You imagine that a person, instead of believing in God, they believe in themselves. All right, very nice, you believe in yourself. But then you can't really be happy for somebody else to be successful because there's this tinge of like, is a takeaway from me? Why can't we truly be happy for other people? Because we're looking at our own situation and feeling like ours is deficient. If you didn't feel like your life was deficient, if you felt like I have everything I need, and if I don't have what I need, I have all the tools to make sure I'm gonna get what I need. If you feel that way, you could be happy for somebody else because you're simply put, you're truly available for them to be successful too because what does that have to do with you? That doesn't take from you. But without God, you're stuck with survival of the fittest and if survival of the fittest dictates to a certain degree that if you're successful, you've taken a bit away from my ability to be successful. And what kind of life is that? So in order to be a successful person, I'm not sure you can even engage in that conversation. And first and foremost, you need to develop the attitude, belief that you're gonna be successful. And as a Jew, that means that there is enough, not only for everyone, but there is enough things in your life to get you to where you need to get to. There are enough tools for you to be successful, no matter what your limitations are. And this is a big idea, to say the least. So two of the biggest issues that get in the way from people adopting this, right? If it's that easy, why don't we do it? The two biggest issues that get in the way of people adopting this message of believing in their success is number one, People judge themselves pretty harshly. People don't believe in themselves. They don't believe they have the tools. They don't believe in their talents. There's a multitude of reasons why people stop believing in themselves, but it's the ultimate challenge is people have a hard time believing that they're capable of doing it. They have a hard time seeing their actual uh, abilities. And then the other one is as soon as you finally have the guts to go out there, if it doesn't work out, people feel like that's it, I gave it my shot and it didn't work out, so I'm gonna take a step back. And both of those elements literally get in the way of people believing as a full-time existence that they're gonna be successful as an individual. And that is really a major impediment to not only living a successful life, but every day waking up with that idea that today's gonna to be a successful day because it inches one level closer to me aligning me living in this world and developing all the tools necessary to get there and to really maximize my potential. So in this idea, it's worth going back to the, to the center of Judaism of why we believe in rights and equality. The real reason Judaism believes in rights and equality is because God created everyone. The words are, we were created in the image of God. And if God is good enough, then so is everything created by God. And Jewish people, the idea that people can kill in the name of God has always really hurt us deeply. Because as God-fearing people, killing people in the name of God represents that there's not enough in this world for everybody to be who they are. So it's not just an abundance of physicality, but there's not enough space for all space for all people. Jewish people, by definition, one of our great hallmarks is not only I believe what I believe, I allow you to believe what you believe. Why do I allow? Not because I don't think mine is right. It's because you being who you are need to tap into your depth and be very honest about what you're believing in. And if you're not projecting on other people, which I know I project ever so slightly, ever so subtly on other Jewish people, it's partly because of the lack of Jewish opportunity of learning out there and me trying to be somebody who does that. That's part of what I do. And uh, if you weren't showing up, I'd take the hint, I promise. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, being able to be self-sufficient as a Jew, you also gotta tap into the beginning of our belief of what it means to really have God. And for that, we'll, we'll read a text over here, text nine, okay? Uh, turn in your books to page, to page 40, where are we? 40, 48, 48, okay? Here's the text. The human being was created in God's image and thereby is similar to God. 
may he be blessed. The human being created in the image of God has the distinctive characteristics of being auto autonomous like God, who is free to do as he wishes. So too we human beings have the power to do as we wish. We have choice. What does this mean? This is Rabbi Yehuda Loi. This is the original rabbi of Prague. If you ever been to Prague and see the Alt Neuschul, the old Neuschul that's still around. Uh, rabbi Yehuda Loi was the rabbi there. He lived a long life and contributed much to Judaism, to say the least. We're still uncovering the greatness of Rabbi, of, of rabbi Loi of Prague and a uh, great philosopher. And Rabbi Yehuda Loi, the Maharal of Prague, as he's known, gave this idea that when you think about being created in the image of God, what you're really coming to terms with is that everybody has free choice and they don't overlap. Everybody has the ability to be their own being with free choice and to maximize their potential and it can't take away from somebody else. That's a big idea. That's a huge idea. Can we integrate that? Judaism says you have to, to really be successful. You have to integrate that competition is only who could be better in their own life. Like when you see something, you're like, wow, I could be that good. I could be even better. That's called holy competition, where you're inspired by other things to be even better. If you're in a relationship with somebody, you shouldn't have competition, but you should have holy competition, which means I'm inspired by you to be even better, to try even harder, to dig even deeper. So competitiveness inherently is a good thing, but it went wrong in society because it turned into this idea, I have to win because if I win, and by the way, this trickle down, people don't like it in sports. I'm not talking about sports where, where winning is the only way to really define who persevered. But in life, it's not a game, it's not sports, and you can't define success for somebody else, you could only define it for yourself. And if we're telling you that you could define it for yourself and it doesn't take away from somebody else, that's asking real introspection on your part, it's asking you to be really deep. A little while ago, somebody was talking to me about how they're getting into spirituality and Judaism. And I was telling them that spirituality isn't a side thing for people who are spiritual. Spirituality and Judaism is not even mystical or Kabbalistic. Spirituality is your inlet to Judaism because spirituality only means things outside of my own existence. A spiritual person has no problem with somebody else being successful, has no problem with being happy for other people, and has no problem with believing that it's gonna work out for them because they recognize that outside of them is a tremendous universal cosmic engine of things happening. And on one hand, they're very small and insignificant, but on the other hand, their value is immeasurable in the physical. It's only measurable in the bigger picture. And since the bigger picture is elusive, we could merely try to take the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and learn to align them to our core. And the more we align them to our core, the more we're able to expose what we're all about. And that inherently means that one person doesn't overlap another person. And that's truly what it means to de 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 tap into success. Another uh, local Jewish uh, psychological developer, and in this case, uh, in this case, we're talking about uh, a real pioneer uh, in the field of neur neuroplasticity. And uh, you have over here Dr. What's his name? Uh, Michael uh, Merzenich. Michael Merzenich. I was watching his TED talk today, called "Growing Evidence of Brain Plasticity," and it's a phenomenal talk. And the talk is basically how, you know, I, the, the way to explain it is people used to think about like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. In other words, when people get older, they become more set in their ways. But neuroplasticity in the field of neurodevelopment, they're finding that the more you learn things and the more you engage in new fields, the more your brain keeps on developing and responding in that. And uh, we can talk more about it off camera, but the, the, the idea is phenomenal in Jewish tradition. Why is this idea phenomenal in Jewish tradition? Because one, we believed this for thousands of years. One of our oldest stories, 2,000 years ago, we have the great sage Rabbi Akiva. You hear Rabbi Akiva ever? The line, love your fellow as yourself, everyone knows that line. That line was made famous by Rabbi Akiva. It was said by Hillel the Elder, but it was made famous by Rabbi Akiva, who said this is the principle of Judaism, right? Hillel said the rest is, uh, is commentary. Rabbi Akiva said this is the core principle of Judaism. So Rabbi Akiva is the lover, he's very famous, and, uh, and he's a, a really beloved character in our lore and tradition. 
But one of the things that people don't know about him is that he was uneducated prior to his 40th birthday. He, ne he was the greatest Torah scholar in the top, maybe top 10 all time, you know? Post second, definitely second temple and on one of the, one of the greatest. And he didn't start studying till he was 40. So one would think that at 40 years old to start studying to become the greatest sage in something is impossible. But in Judaism, that's our story. And until neuroplasticity came around, it was hard to back it up as a plausible way of life. But the story goes that Rabbi Akiva was inspired by his wife to be to, to uh, be a better person. And he, instead of doing that to get married and he's still, you know, futzing around, and she's like, I married you, so you should go study. I believe in you. I believe in the kind of person you are. And Rabbi Akiva sitting, he was a shepherd in the simpleton, and he sees the way water is hitting a rock, and he sees that in the rock there's a hole. And it occurs to him if that if over years water hitting a rock could create a hole, in other words, create space, even in something like a rock, if I would apply myself at a matter of time, I would be able to change my capacity to absorb the information. And he does that. He spends 24 years studying day and night and becomes the greatest sage in Israel. And he has 24,000 students. And it's this wonderful story worth looking up in all of its details and all of its wondrous ideas. But the idea that we're tapping into is that we are finally living in a world where these aren't just concepts in Judaism. They're realities. For us, science is there to expand the way, the way godliness is, is understood in this world. The deeper we go, excuse me, the more comfortable we feel with God. It's, un, it's interesting that when science was really picking up, it was like anti-God, you know, to be science. And now I, I not only don't see that, that field, I see it entirely as, to me, neuroplasticity is, is godly. It's the idea that a tool that you have no matter how much is being used, can always be broken. So in that sense, I think we really need to tap into that and tap into this development of what kind of person we need to be. So that was one, to address the one, one of the biggest problems is not believing in yourself. You have to stop looking at yourself as somebody who doesn't have the tools. You can't see yourself as somebody who doesn't have something. You're not missing anything. And whatever you're missing, you have the tools to get. The catch-22 is to your benefit. If you don't feel like you have what you need, you have to know that you have the tools to acquire it. And if you don't think you have the tools to acquire it, know that you contain the tools to acquire it. It just needs to be worked on and developed and it will come out. So what about you've tried and it didn't work out? What about that difficulty? What does Judaism say about that? So before we get to that, let's first part, I need to pause for a second. Any questions or comments from you here? Anybody want to say anything? Do you want to read the comments from online? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so most of the people are happy that we changed the whole thing. Okay, good. Uh, Moishe Goldman says, uh, I tip my hat to yours. Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Ethan Wagner say, hey, parents. What's up, my brother? <laughs> That's all. Okay, how about you guys? Um, what if you feel always caught up in routine and not even being able to like think globally about what you want to achieve? Being like too tired basically to... Maybe you know that you have tools, but you're always... So you're saying you exhausted. feel the void, but you feel exhausted. Yeah. We're going to talk about more tools in the week to go. So let's just use the tools from tonight and last week to answer that. Let's use our, our lens right now. Okay. What we're saying right now is you bring a very valid idea. A lot of people, it's not, you know, indulgence or looking in the wrong place. It's simply exhaustion. I work hard. I, I keep busy. I do what I'm supposed to do. And like, well, either let's start from the beginning. Have you uncovered your innermost will yet? What is my innermost will? What do I truly desire while I'm here on earth? Last week's question, right? I think that like, I think if you know what that is, so first and foremost, let's say a person 
feels the void, like they know they're not living up to their potential or they know that they're not actively making this world a better place or they know that, let's say, whatever it is, first thing is starting to become more in touch with what is my innermost will? What is my innermost desire? Do I know what that is? Do I, do I, you can go as far as having to write a mission statement about that innermost will, like how do I effectively get there? So first thing is uncovering, do you know what your innermost will is? What are you, what really makes you go? What, what are you really about? Then you have to be able, if that, if let's say you have that, stage two would be, all right, what am I doing in my life right now that fits that goal? Let's not even talk about being tired and stuff. Let's talk about what am I doing to get that, to get that done? Everybody has time once a week to do this. And here's a good time to state the time of day is very important of when you sit down and do this. The time you're supposed to take a self accountant, a self account, account, take accountability. A self accountability on what I'm doing and who I'm supposed to be, the time is before you go to bed. Most people, before they go to bed, if they're lucky, it's a book or it's an iPad in their face. The last thing before you go to bed should be a deep accounted counting of who I am. What am I? You should wake up feeling like you are connected to the person you're trying to be. And you can't do that every night, I understand. But once a week, a person can't, all right, I need to go to sleep. I'm gonna go stop 10 minutes earlier in the movie I'm watching or the articles I'm reading or the deep dive on eBay I'm doing. And I'm going to just spend 10 minutes writing down what I think my innermost will is and am I doing anything to get there? That's step one to being a successful person. Step two, which was the end of last class, I know that part, let's say. Let's say I feel like I know what I wanna be when I grow up, but what am I doing to get my outside, my external realities, my work, my relationships, my pleasure activities, do those things align with who I wanna be? The term we use for that here at Zahoot is the ability to be a contributor even within my consumption would be the term we use. Those two. And if you have those two, like you feel like you generally do the things that connect to who you wanna be, but like how do you know you don't feel successful, you don't feel like you're getting there, <coughs> well then you have to ask yourself, are you using your tools? Like you are given all these amazing tools to be successful, how many of your tools are being left dormant? Sometimes your work doesn't access all of your tools and you need to find places to use those tools. Sometimes you don't even need places to use those tools. You need times when you're not in an environment that doesn't use those tools. Like our Friday night idea, we talk a lot about lucrative rest. Another level of Shabbat is when I see myself in a different lens. Person needs that too. All those things are not tool related to success, but perspective Latin to help you get there. So I think that's a little bit of, of getting us on the process. Any, any other questions or comments? And the last thing we left off with was, was what, was, was what about the limitations? I went out there, I tried my best and it didn't work out. Well, for that, we have to bring up Jewish people being slaves in Egypt. Why do we have to do that? Because the Jewish people maintained over 250 years of ultimate limitations. Let's not even call slavery carnage, just call it severe limitations. Just imagine being in a box and not being able to move. That's what slavery feels like. When people are challenged with the idea of slavery, they're challenged with the idea of being able to roam free. And not roam, free. when I talk about roam free, to not, you know, when we say God came to Moses, to, to Moses came to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Of course, that's not the whole line. He said, let my people go so they can serve me. There was, no, there was no apostrophe there. In America, we shortened it. Let my people go. But that's not what it is. It's let my people go so they can serve me. In other words, you can't, be, you can't serve God if you're not free. It's interesting how people see God as a, sort of, sort of a form of servitude. But in reality, you can't serve God unless you're free. The whole point of serving God is to be in a personal relationship. Judaism we're talking about, right? Wants you to be in a personal relationship. 
You can't do that unless you're a free person. So, so technically what Judaism wants is for you to be a, 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 a personal contractor of sorts, right? Where you contract out your time. Working for somebody full time, they own you. That's not our ideal goal. That's how it works in today's world. You need certain benefits and certain developments in order to achieve that. But really you wanna be your own boss. Really you wanna be able to trust yourself. And where did Jewish people get this idea from? What was, the, what was really being limited in Egypt all about? Well, the thing was, was Jewish people had to tap into that even though we're in slavery, it's an imposed situation. But it's not self-imposed. I will not let that define me. In other words, when you have to deal with the fact that you were unsuccessful in previous attempts, you have a choice here. You have free choice. Your choice is, am I gonna define myself by these things that did not work out? Or am I, in other words, define myself by my failures? Or am I gonna define myself by success? One of the reasons why I feel compelled to stay connected to my Jewish brothers and sisters in Paris, for example, is because a lot of the Judaism could be felt through anti-Semitic lenses. Growing up, I used to meet people, <coughs> excuse me, who often spoke about anti-Semitic moments they had. I'm not religious, but I was called out or my nose was picked out of a crowd or something. And it really inspired me to try to create positive Jewish moments for people so that that should be what they reach out. When they think of Judaism, it should be positive. And in America, overall, it's become like that. We can't take for granted the, the beauty of this country and this land and the evolving character of this country that's allowed us to be who we are. It's overwhelmingly a non-anti-Semitic a non, a non -anti -Semitic oxymoronic statement beep, um, going on. It's really fascinating. And in that sense, this is for success. If you feel like you've been unsuccessful in things that you've tried, now the question becomes, are you defining yourself by those? Maybe those failures were just experiences that you needed in order to achieve the success you need to. You can't argue with that. Experience is the one thing you can acquire without going through it. Jewish people use the experience of slavery to evolve as human beings entirely. It's an amazing, amazing phenomenon that we mention every day that we were slaves for the simple reason of not being defined by the slavery, but being defined by the freedom and being defined by what we define ourselves by. An amazing experience. So it is my hope that people feel compelled and inspired to start to find themselves by their talents and by being successful and learn to take their outer workings, their work, their relationships, their jobs, and connect them to their inner desires and will, which I believe no matter how dig you deep, you will find a better and better part of you. I know Freud says when you dig deep, you find other things, but Judaism says there's even deeper than that, and you're conscious, and you're subconscious, and then the recesses of who you are is a reservoir of pure goodness. And if you believe that, then you believe you're gonna have success in whatever you do because goodness will always, in the big picture, find a way to inspire, to connect, and to more importantly, accomplish everything that you need to accomplish. So uh, I appreciate y'all tuning in and uh, have a wonderful evening. And thank you for all the, for all the, the good wishes.